we're running a little behind because, well, toddlers, basically. Curiously enough, several of the people in this chat are moms. And one of the things about being a mom is that sometimes your kid takes over your life for an extra few minutes or an extra few days. So we're going to talk about that tonight. We are going to have um, some in-depth discussion of police brutality and, you know, our usual not quite pre-approved range of, of foolishness and silliness because that's why you're watching us, frankly. So, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am Mickey Kindle, a.k.a. Carnethia. The introductions can begin. Lanasa? Hi. Um, what do we introduce ourselves? Yes, yourselves. Okay. Okay, Inasa, a.k.a. So True. Uh, Dexter? I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Dexter Morgan. I am <laughs> the co-founder of um, Hood Feminism. I yeah, where's your camera? The, I also go by the way of the id and Jamie Nesbitt Golden. Um, my camera is uh, giving me flux right now. So you'll just have to deal with this face for a while. It's okay. She just wants to scare us all. I really do. <laughs> Never forget. That's what I say. As long as you're not Strug. like. I didn't tell the shrug is here or not. No? Okay, oh, Sadet, go ahead. I'm Sadet Harry, also known as Black Amazon, and I am broadcasting today in my Avengers t shirt. I want to talk about movies, I think. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and I am I'm Zahira Kelly, also known as uh, Bad Dominicana on Twitter and Tumblr. Hi, I got a toddler in the background too. Little <laughs> <laughs> babies. Mm. Okay, so let me lead off because I have some things on my spirit. <laughs> oh, I don't believe in holding things for too long. Some of you may know, I wrote a piece for RHR today saying that for black mothers, every every decision is feminism. Um, and everything is a feminist issue, and that's great, but also let's really have this moment about motherhood and the expectations that black mothers will put their kids aside. I am not your mammy. <laughs> they are not your mammy. Like, let me just get real, real blunt and real, real in your face, because you all saw the cleaned up version of a piece that was originally really profane. <laughs> the reality is this. We are mothers. We are sisters. We are daughters. We are all of these identities. And whether you like this or not, whether you know this or not, there is no interest in me getting free and leaving my kids behind. And I have sons. So let me tell you about teenage boys and how much they need mama and how much they're going to have mama. They're going to have that time. They're going to have that attention. That doesn't make me any less feminist. That means that I'm, I'm a mother. I'm, I'm a feminist. I'm going to make sure my son is a good person. And part of doing that is this crazy thing where like, you raise your kids, right? And if you have the privilege to be able to spend more time with your kids and less time at work, then Absolutely. If that is what you choose to do, I am here for you. I don't think that's anti-feminist at all. That is absolutely a feminist decision because your children are part of your community and we are here to preserve our communities. Okay. Also, again, I am not your mammy. Like, let me just really break this out because the next time you come, maybe we with some strong black woman and well, but, but you can put that child aside because my baby is not about to grow up without mom while I take care of your kids, because again, not your mammy. Did I mention? Not your mammy. <laughs> let that go. Let let it go. Let it go. But mammy here's the first real. thing you said that was problem, problematic. Mm -hmm. Number one, not mammy. Number two, community. We still haven't really talked about the culture and community of feminism and the fact that there are cultural and community norms that keep getting repeated that we're not addressing. Like, we keep talking about how we need to raise men that are not rapists. We have to teach men that rape is not okay. But we do not talk about how we support the people who develop these people into human, into grown-ass people. So, mm -hmm. if we're not supporting mothers, if we're not supporting a culture 
that creates a non-misogynistic understanding of what it means to be a caretaker. How do we expect to grow these people that will destroy patriarchy and destroy rape culture? Number three, okay, let's go right back to under what umbrella did we ascertain that Michelle Obama was feminist? Under what umbrella do we ascertain that any of a lot of these women they're critiquing are feminists? Like, I hate, like, yes, I think, I personally think much though my experience doesn't support that, that feminism is vital and useful, but there's this assumption that because it's a woman, you have a right to critique her under a feminist rubric that she doesn't necessarily agree to. There's a reason, wait, reason that we have to talk about it as a movement. We are working towards making people become a part of this. We can't assume that they're there. Wait, wait, are you are you trying to say that Michelle Obama might self-identify, might have her own definitions, might make her own choices and decisions about what she believes? Are you are you saying that right now? Are you saying that Michelle Obama, a grown-up, fully-fledged adult human being, might be out here making decisions for herself? I'm saying... Are you sure she can do that? I'm saying... <laughs> Are you sure? Who, I'm saying that a woman who went to Harvard and Princeton and ran a hospital and got married and had kids really doesn't necessarily need to take advice from people who can barely put together a cogent article Ooh. simply because they are white and call themselves writers. And I'm saying that in public. Oh, okay. Uh, the, okay, okay just all the... I can't see anything from all the shade that just got thrown. Right, like it got really dark. Like, I can't... Like, you can't put together a comrade. Wow. <laughs> Sit down. Sit down. Well, and also, let me just say, because it wasn't like it was just white women coming out their mouths with this stuff lately. If you, dear you, black, brown, whatever, have come to this conclusion that Michelle Obama should lead her life according to what you think is best, I'm going to need you to step back. I'm going to need you to turn and look in the mirror. Is Michelle Obama's face looking back at you? Are you, in fact, Michelle Obama? You are not. So there's this concept you should acquaint yourself with. They call it a lane, and you should stay in it. Her life is not your lane. I promise her life is not your lane. Just a thought. Look, like, look, okay. You wrote an article because you think she should raise her daughters a certain way. You think she should do whatever charity she should talk about, whatever issue. And I get it. She's in a unique position. Do you understand an in said unique position of raising two black girls in the, in the public eye? Of being the first black woman to sit in the White House and not be working there? Is it possible? Possible it has occurred to you that just maybe she's got enough to be going on with because let's see, right, as of late, I've heard, you know, style icon, um, first to make this history of being the black first lady, like all of these things. And oh, yeah, she's got kids to raise. Her mother is there. I'm noticed you don't see her mother as much as you used to. I don't know if mom has health concerns or just isn't tired of the public eye. But either way, she's got a house to run. She's got a couple of initiatives going. And oh, yeah, there's that husband, too. Like she's doing the having it all in the way that works for her. Not like she can go out to a job where she's anonymous and not the first lady. She is the first lady all the time. And the first lady's duties are numerous anyway. And oh, if we forgot this, missed this, whatever. She has no political aspirations. She never had any political aspirations. In fact, she is in the White House with her husband after they made an agreement about him and running for office. Because, frankly, she could have happily stayed at the hospital she was running in this neighborhood that she loves, near her family, relatively anonymous, and been okay with her money in her house. Like, don't get it twisted. She's already doing service. She's already doing public service. She's doing more public service than most of us will ever do. But let's, let, 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 let me, because I'm still in my cranky mode on this. Okay. Let's talk about this husband. Because mm -hmm. to me, she's the central. But this is the husband with the most death threats of any U.S. president ever. This is the husband that is the father of daughters who has gotten more death threats and more comments about their appearances and more following than 
any child of a government. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> That's my mom. Can my we? Mom. Can we? Yeah. Hi, mom. Can Can we talk about how these are girls who you've got to shield from that media? You've got to make sure not only are they growing up healthy, sane, stable, and not in the bottle of liquor underneath the table. Because <laughs> frankly, some days I read things about them that makes me reach for a bottle, and that's not me they're talking about. That's not my baby they're talking about. Mm -hmm. but you like, got to cover all of that. You have to cover as a mom. all of that. You, have to, you also are trying to raise these young women by being an example. And being an example of saying, this are, these are my limits, these are my boundaries. And having mm -hmm. them, and the this this mm -hmm. and there's another part of this is where she got during the re-election in 2012. There was all of these women who are suddenly discovering that oh wow she's not a feminist nightmare, but who were ruthlessly condescending about her description of herself as mom and chief. Yep. Like there was mm -hmm. who, I don't even know who it is who was like I dream of the day when a when powerful women don't have to qualify themselves by being a mother. I'm like, you must be from some place where you got to be a mother all throughout your mothering history and never have that be a problem. Because this conversation we're having right now, right, right now, is the exact same conversation that Ida B. Wells was having with Susan B. Anthony when she tried to go off and have her kids. Like, I, it's 2013, mm. and we're having this conversation in 1913. And we're not talking about that. Mm. We're not talking about this idea of the construction of motherhood for them as being as a burden because you actually got to do it. My happy West Indian self, if I was to get married or when I get married and it, when I become a stay-at-home mom, because I'm telling you I'm taking at least five years off for the babies, will be the first person to not have to work in the, my direct family line since we got brought over on the ships from the Mahafa. Everybody else worked. So all of the people in my family who came from Madras, India, and doing the sugar cane, and the slaves who came over have been working, have been dealing with what it means to be a parent and be a mother under forced labor. And this decision that, oh, I've moved on to something different, or we need to move on to something different, is one of the whitest things I've ever seen. Because you may be some of the few people who have ever had that choice. She said one of the whitest things I have ever seen. She did. She just came on out there. She made sure y'all knew that you wasn't nothing. She don't even like you. Stop it. <laughs> She's not here for your bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like, I felt that in my chest. My spirit moved. But it's true. Like, my grandmother had periods of being a stay-at-home mother. But these periods of being a stay-at-home mother were paired with my grandfather owning a business and working a job. No, I said a business and working a job. And even then, that didn't mean she didn't bring in any money. It just meant she didn't go out to work. Right? So... When we talk about this, and I've had my own period to being a stay-at-home mom, and my husband and I rotated. Also, let's talk about, like, I know that for the Obamas, child care costs are not an issue, but for most women, for most mothers, there are periods of time where child care matters, where you are absolutely going to have to worry about how much this costs, who you can get there, what you can spend, what you, you can afford to spend on child care. We already know, and we've heard and this even before. Then, Major feminist orgs, maybe not so welcoming to moms, because moms have needs that might be special. Not really, but, you know, humans. So, when your feminism says, yeah, 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 I know you got kids, I know you're doing all this stuff, I know whatever, but I want you to do this other thing this way, because I say so, and that's what's really feminist. Shut up. <laughs> Like, really, shut up. Stop talking. Don't come over here shut with up, that. Shut up, just shut up and leave us alone. I had a Florida Evans reaction to that, that, that article in the shut Time up, Magazine defense of it. I Man. literally, damn, Man. damn, Man. damn. <laughs> because I have read that article 48 times now. From I have read a version women. of the articles. Yes. 
from 48 different women. And look, all y'all got my mammy issues. I'm going to tell you the truth. That's what I see. I see mammy issues. You want Michelle Obama to be mammy. You want her to put her kids aside. You want her to put her love life with her husband aside. You want her to serve your needs because that's what you're comfortable with. If she's not welfare queen, if she's not Jezebel or Sapphire, then she's got to be Manny. What do you mean she's none of those and she still exists? She's impossible. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll get a little cranky. I'm a, I'm a little cranky. Though. I mean, you should, I mean, you should calm down. I mean, you should calm down just a little. Just a tad. For what? Turn down for what? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is people who have no idea that it is a privilege for some of us. It is an entitlement to be able to raise your own child. Like, my mama basically worked, like, 16 hours a day, like, fucking six days a week. And it was like, I was going from childcare to childcare that was, like, abusive. My mother had to import, <laughs> practically. My mother, uh, my grandmother is, is not an import, but... I'm just saying, you know, like, that's kind of how it's seen, but, I mean, my mother had to actually go through the process of getting my grandmother a green card so that my grandmother could come take care of us, so that my mother could work, because she was supporting three kids on her own, so it's like, for me to be able to stay home at any point and raise my own child, that is, like, a privilege, like, mm -hmm. excuse me if some people want to actually be the one raising their child instead of, like, you know, strangers. I mean, is that really so unreasonable? You know what I'm saying? Especially when you just don't know who anybody is. Because, like I said, every single child care provider I ever had was pretty much abusive because I was the quiet, dark little girl who was always in the corner, so it was, like, easy to take shit out on me, basically. Okay, let's you talk know? about that. Let's talk about the idea that a lot of it, because my mother, who we, hi mom, who we don't come in, but let's talk about how a lot of her life was around when navigating childcare and wondering what would happen because there yep. is no quarter of space for young black girls. Mm -hmm. So there's not, this. we're not like, Michelle Obama, not an idiot. So she knows what it's like to be a black girl. She knows what it's like to is raising black girls, so she might could want to give certain protections. Because let's be really honest, all of these people who are questioning how she's been on feminism have yet to be supportive of women like her who are not her. Well, because I don't see a lot of them talking about the lack of black women in positions of power while they're talking about lean-in philosophy. No one's talking about the comparatively low salaries for black women. No one's talking about the lack of positions. No one's talking about the violence. No one's talking about the sexual assault rate. We're all running around talking about the drinking problem, but we're not talking about why is it that black women have a higher rate of sexual assault, but we drink less. So maybe running our mouths about this drinking round and round in the goddamn circle is not where we need to be. We don't talk about these things, but we magically want black women to lay out all of our work and all of our lives for the service of what? For, for the service of what? What does Michelle Obama or any black woman get if they're a better feminist? What do we get? I don't get a paycheck. I don't get a shiny award. It doesn't make mm -hmm. it easier to walk mm -hmm. the streets. It doesn't rebuild the boardwalk in my neighborhood. Mm -mm. It doesn't feed my kids. It doesn't improve my schools. It doesn't improve my job prospects. So what exactly do I get from being a better feminist? Well, so here's my question. When we talk about being a better feminist, what is a better feminist? Right? Hey, I because... Oh, ooh, okay. Uh -oh. No, I mean... I, it's, it's uh, Dexter makes me nervous. <laughs> no. It's, the only time I'm scared of you. The only time I, I, in life. Sort of, yeah. But, uh, but no, I... I ooh, ooh, ooh. Yesterday. 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 No, oh, just struggle oh, said better okay. better feminist. Well, better feminist to who? Better feminist to black women is different than white women or any other women. That was from D Strug. Yeah. Well oh. who's the bomb dot com. <laughs> Hands down. Go ahead, Jamie. <laughs> But no, but what I was, but I, what I asked yesterday on Twitter, like, what does it mean <laughs> when, when the work is solid, when, but the character is shit? Like, what does it say when, when we, you know, we, we do, you know, what, what we produce, good work, and you know, we talk about things that need to be talked about, but behind closed doors, we don't live what we, what we preach. 
And how does that affect? Well, are we really preaching it consistently? Right. Well, yes. Yeah. And and how does that and how does that affect not only us but but the women that we're supposed to be advocating for? First of all, I think you're being kind and saying that a lot of these people are doing good work because I think there's amazing work out there, but it's not the other side. So I want to know who you're talking about doing good work but having bad politics first and foremost. Well, that's like not, I said, I'm not going to name any names because I'm not, you know, about that life right now. Um, but I, I know. <laughs> But I know that we've we've talked about. To be perfectly honest, before. real talk. I know, I know, but like I feel like we've we've talked about these folks before, and they've gotten you know enough shine. But even within our circles, I feel like there is a definite us versus them thing happening, and that sort of bleeds into um, what we what we claim we're trying to accomplish. If that makes any sense. Um. Well. I think I think part of it though then becomes the question because are we actually doing the work or are we talking about the concept of doing the work hmm. in this way where we now know you know oh well this has happened and we we know this happened but we're not going to talk about this work we're not going to really talk to the people we're supposedly doing this work for because you know I know in all of these concerned trolley pieces around Michelle Obama or Beyonce or whatever it's black woman as object it's black mother as object it is not black person yeah it's right it's, it's that's in the abstract not so much mm -hmm. yeah you know and so when we're talking about and also, also you know okay Finish your thoughts. I was going to say that I, I'm not sure like how this is related, but I feel like it's related like at the same time that like I feel like it's another form of this like policing or disciplining where on one hand it's kind of like you're not a good feminist, but yet you're still responsible for everything bad in the world. Mm -hmm. It's like somehow, like, you know, Beyonce or Michelle Obama don't have the, you know, knowledge or intellect or ability or whatever it is, you know, that's kind of being hinted at in coded language to, like, you know, see the light. Like, they don't have that ability, but yet somehow, like, Beyonce is responsible for sex trafficking. Like, Michelle Obama is responsible for drones single handedly. So there's this, I don't know, there's this, I just feel like this thing that's been happening, like, especially this week, but just lately, where it's like, but, so it's not, yeah, it's not even about, like, actual women, it's just, like, becoming symbols for whatever's convenient at that moment. Yeah, I mean, this, well, uh, what happened with this thing? I mean, there was somebody saying that Beyonce is responsible for drones. I mean, Come again? this is just kind of like, oh. like how is Beyonce responsible for drones? And it's kind of like, oh, you're not radical enough, oh, because um, uh, they, they, it's like they tried to compare. It's like this is a uh, an Indian woman, East Indian woman, oh, you know, yes, telling me yes. I'm not oh. radical enough. And you know, this is such a common sentiment though, where she's oh, like, one, well, Beyonce's on the same level as Lily Allen, who's a racist, anti-black piece of shit. Who is comes for money from a dad who has money, you know, and basically had everything handed to her. Beyonce, who worked her, her ass off from like, you know, when she was like a little girl or whatever, and is black, who's a product of freaking slavery and the afterlife of slavery, is somehow on equal terms as an as a racist, you know, white woman because she has the nerves to be famous and have nice things. Like, can we? It's like okay, you now now drones are your fault because you don't oppose Obama enough or something like that. Like, are are we, are we really doing this? Now she has no agency to wear sparkly suits. That's just sluttiness. That's just male gaze. How, however, she has enough agency to have drones drop on children somehow. Like, well, are we and okay like okay, here? and this is the thing. Let's, let, let's talk about. Let me. I have to have this moment about the, the Beyonce and the sparkly suit, and she's responsible for human trafficking because I think we're talking about the same woman who manages to blame Beyonce for the record for everything, and gets published blaming her. These are not things that she says as motherings on Twitter before someone thinks we're talking about a troll. You can find at least I know one of the articles I've seen her write before about Beyonce, because um, she wrote an open letter to Michelle Obama about how Beyonce was not a good role model for the for her daughters. Um, mm -hmm. 
But what you're seeing is people saying our sex, our very sexuality is a weapon, right? We don't have any right to hold mm. on to that. But when Miley does it, mm. Miley is being free and don't slut shame her. But where were you when you were mad because Beyonce wore a spangly jumpsuit? Where are you when she's being blamed for everything under the sun? Because if you are black and not talking about drones, apparently that means you support them and you support Obama. And also somehow, and I'm going to say this just flat out, when did we decide that drones are new or came from Obama? Because I would really like someone to explain to me. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Don't you understand that everything that America, that U.S. imperialism struck? Hey. Hey. (laughs) <laughs> everything that U.S. imperial that the U.S. country is does, everything that's happened, whether it's actions in Haiti, whether it's Guantanamo Bay, whether it's drones, Obama's the only American president to have ever done that. He's not continuing a legacy of U.S. imperialism that strike back stretches back to the Monroe Doctrine, if not before that. He's not continuing, you know, just the positionality of the U.S. president, which is you're the head of the world empire. I'm not sure why people think that that's a position you can be in and then behave ethically. I don't know if people just don't like we see scandal. We see the next one like we see the born identity. I'm just saying in our popular culture we seem to understand that certain things are kind of corrupt and beyond being redeemable, but somehow Obama was supposed to single handedly like stop the US from being an empire. Mm-hmm. I want to know when they decided that he was going to do that. Now, I am not the biggest fan because there are lies that have been told, but there are things he ran on that he literally looked us in the looked us in the face with them steely brown eyes and said, "I don't know who you think you elected, but I'm not exactly the anti-imperialist or anti-materialist materi- military president. Not that I agree with that at all, but he's not <laughs> lying." At all. He has said that this is what he do. Why are we shocked about what he do, except for the idea that a black president, someone is instantly supposed to be in service? Yeah. Here's my, my, this is, and actually I'm, okay, so here's my thing, because just this, I, I have feelings about people who, who say this, who say things like this, and then are so quick to grab on to like black political ideology to frame like like the I have a drone hashtag, right? Mm-hmm. Like I actually saw someone say that like Barack Obama like uniquely, you know, destroyed Martin Luther King's legacy. <laughs> like he complete you know, just completely what he's done is just completely crapped on Martin Luther King's legacy. And it was just like, okay, so the move bombing in Philadelphia in the seventies, do you know who was the mayor of the city and who authorized that? A black man. Of course they don't. So, so okay, but you're gonna like you're gonna quote Stokely Carmichael, and you're gonna quote the Panthers, and you're gonna post all these pictures of the Panthers on your Tumblr, and you're gonna say I have a drone, but you can't actually take the time to learn about what went down and how Black people got into political power. Anyway, I come from Atlanta. It is a predominantly Black city, and our Black leadership class would not have happened if there weren't several deals with the devil made with the white business class. People have talked about how. There has to be like how this whole respectability politics plays into this and how black politicians mm-hmm. get into power by distancing themselves from the black underclass and by clamping down like on law and, or- law and order solutions. All these drug policies, a lot of these were openly embraced, embraced by black mayors throughout the United States that have like resulted in, you know, now we're all like, oh, the orange Jim Crow, the new Jim Crow, da, da, da. yeah, black people had like a role in, you know, making this a thing. So this idea that just because Barack Obama is black, he must inherently be radical is racist and intellectually bankrupt. And I'm just really, really tired of this. Of, this is just like the fifth time this week that I've just heard some version of like, you know, Barack Obama is just uniquely responsible for everything. I'm not saying we can't hold him accountable. I'm not saying he has no power. I'm saying that once he gets out of office, like his chances of being shot just for walking down the street haven't changed. Mm-hmm. And the American empire is still going to be going on after he leaves it. So, yeah. Well, so let's, let's, no, but let's, so let's have this moment, though, about what is being said to get black people to sign off on these things. Let's have this moment to talk about the fear mongering that goes on that black people are not immune to. Like there's there's some weird idea that if you're black you can see through what the news reports like this knockout game, right? The knockout mm-hmm. game 
I started tweeting at random oh. points. The knockout game is not real. The knockout game is not real. The knockout game is not real. And then had to explain to people and show them that it was not real. And here's where it's been debunked. And here's where even the NYPD don't believe it. Like, we all have that aunt, cousin, grandmother, whatever, who sends you those urban legends, right? Who will tell you not to sit on a movie theater seat because there could be a needle. Or that if someone flashes their lights on you in a dark road, it's a gang initiation. They about to kill you, baby, or whatever, right? We, we've all seen that. So what makes folks think that having established that George Bush went to war, to war based off fake weapons of mass destruction, to war, 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 right? We're not no, no weapons. What makes us think that when we talk to black politicians, black people, black church folk, whatever, that they are somehow mentally immune? cannot be swayed into believing this is the right thing to do. The giant propaganda machine that says words like insurgents, right? The giant propaganda machine that has yet to show us those people and will tell us about scary Muslims and then flash the picture of a Sikh. Um, or conflate <laughs> Obama and Osama <laughs> like wh what you think they're doing in Mima's basement to Mima's mind. Like, look. We all have that relative. We all have that moment. Let's not act like those moments are not occurring regularly and routinely because folks are sitting there and saying to themselves, well, the TV said it, so it must be true. When we talk about the move bombing, they thought those people were terrorists. We have seen the reframing of the Panthers to be 100%. They're a terrorist organization. They were scary and blah, blah, blah. And this is after people know about COINTELPRO. This is after we have talked about the fact that, hey, that was fake, and they tried to get Martin Luther King to commit suicide and all of these things. We are still having to prove that the lunch program, breakfast programs, these are all ideas that came from those radicals that they say are so, so scary. What are your expectations of the average black American? Why you expect them to know more, you expect Obama to know more. He knows what the National Security Advisor and the CIA head and whoever and the Joint Chiefs tell him. He sees the same photos. Like West Wing taught us this, right? Not saying West Wing is 100% accurate, but the, the president gets information from people. He has to theoretically trust those people, but we've already established that those people can get it wrong or, you know, have their own agenda. I mean, Greenwald did happen, right? Snowden did happen. So what are we thinking? What are we seeing? Because we're not thinking. We're not seeing. We're dealing with that continued Afro-pessimism of believing that black people in all our forms are not diverse, are not specific, are not human, and live to serve us. Oh. It's also incredibly classist, you know, because all of this is just tied up into these notions of, of conflating very middle class or upper upper middle class values and ideas as uh, speaking for an entire group of black people that are very diverse, and then it's also completely ignoring the ways that, of course, there's going to be black people who do believe those things or even buy into those things. Um, because either lack of education in the systematic ways that you know, we're withheld resources from knowing these things, or the ways that once you get into these things, you a lot of times feel this pressure to kind of go with the system or to do the things you need to do to make the money and keep your mouth shut. So it's, you know, like a lot of people aren't really talking about the ways that whether you're, no, whether you're poor or middle class or upper class, there's, being black in America is still being tugged at in a million different ways that are trying to get your interests everywhere but your own. You know, and that's especially for black women, people aren't going to keep that, that in perspective or keep that real. And like I said, I, I, I asked about this before we started filming, but this is something that I've noticed a lot with a lot of these third world non-black feminists is as the immigrant West Indian in the room, they don't like to talk about the third world when it comes to talking about predominantly black countries and not dealing with that upper class of those black countries. Because I remember that when she was on Zahira's page, I, I went for her throat, but I was, she's like, I speak for the third world. And I was like, you don't know shit about the third world. You don't know shit about mm -hmm. why black 
West Indians and Caribbeans and Afro-Latinos are in America. You don't know about our experiences. You don't know about our relationship to American empire. Mm -hmm. I could say no for a fact that my country had a lot of intervention in our politics when it looked like we were joining into the global pan-Africanist movement. But we lost our leader. But you speak for everybody. Mm. Mm. And you want to analyze it like... And that's another thing. is that you want to analyze black America like it's African-Americans. And those are very separate. Those are things that are concurrent. But they also have separate experiences. And let's talk about very really about the very specific anti-African-American statement an anti-African-American's anti construction of this country, of this country's media, and the, exp and the expansion of this country's racism that has helped form a general black experience. Because the reason I experience America the way I do as a black person is because of how anti-African-American America is. Mm. Even though I'm not well, technically an African-American, but I am a black American. Yeah. Well, and this is the thing that's that. right, and this is the thing that I I see when I see a lot of feminists of color who are not necessarily black, and, and also even for black feminists, um, there's aside from respectability politics, we get into colorism, right? Some of us are going to pass that paper bag test. Some of us are not. Some of us are going to pass that class test. Some of us are not. Some of us went to the right school. Some of us did not. And, and this ties into into the mother thing, right? My oldest child is 14 years old. The question people mask with the, oh, you don't look that old, is really, so you had him when you were like 15, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, actually, I'm 37. I, I had him when I was 23. And then the next question is, oh, so, you know, his dad, whatever, oh, my ex-husband. Ex-husband, you were married? And I've actually had someone say to me, you were married? Like they couldn't fathom, wow. right? And so when we're in this space and we're talking about these things, America exports a particular image of black American, right? Thank you. Specifically Thank you. of African American. It is framed a specific way. We are not exotic. We are not this. We are not that. We are, again, well for Queen Mammy Jezebel or Sapphire. Those are our roles, and when we don't fit into those, or we reject those, we don't just have conflict with the state or conflict with whiteness. We have conflict with people who are of color but are not necessarily, and I say this a lot, my skin folk are not my kin folk, always. They are not necessarily absent from the context. Not my folk. They do not <laughs> always have my back. And if you keep trying to tell that lie, you'll see where it has left us at. Hey, you've been witnessing that, haven't you? <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, scared. I, I just, I, I have, and, and you know, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've been having issues, feelings, all of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. You, we've been having like just this, like this weekend, like this, this some white chick from Greece starts this thing where it's just like starts with a critique of MIA, like perpetuating U.S. hegemony or something, and then by the end of it, it's like, well, black rappers uphold capitalism around the world, and. You know, and what's interesting to me is just that it seems like for, for, and you guys are talking about this, for this particular group, it seems like you can't ever really talk about class. It seems like whenever, you know, these sort of concepts, certain concepts of like U.S. imperialism or Western privilege or occupation, you know, when we talk about these things, it's kind of like, okay, and the possibility of black Americans extending these things, it's like, okay, well, how many black Americans have a passport? How many black Americans have a passport and use that regularly? In particular, African Americans? Americans, because that's, you know, you want to talk about the black yes. American spirits versus African Americans. You know, some black, um, Afri you know, some black Americans have to have a passport or else they're living undercover and off the books in a real sucked up ass hard existence. Very true. And just well, and like, also, I don't know, just the. 
And how yes. much money does a passport cost? Like, that never comes out on the table. How much money do a lot of these things that make you dignified and worry, worthy cost? I'm from, like I said, I'm a black American. Most of my family is outside the country. I have a passport. Do you know how much that thing costs? Do you know the sacrifices you have to make to continue to have a passport? We have had to make things, do things like run buck up right against the rent just to get a passport. But that builds into my specific experience. If someone can't afford that, why are all of these people talking about, oh, they're uncultured and blah, 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 blah. And no one's talking about if you would like a current passport, it costs about $300. Yeah. And that's what well, I'm saying. I was like, a lot of these people, if you scratch the surface, they're kids who like went to international schools. Mommy or daddy was a diplomat or a banker or a businessman. And they could continent hop without it being that much of a problem. And so that's the position that a lot of them, not all of them by far, not all, but just in my experience of talking to people online, that's where a lot of them are coming from. And it's one of those things where it's just kind of like, yo, like, you know, like I saw one of these people being like, oh my gosh, like tickets to Nigeria are only $400. That's great. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know, like I come from a middle class background. I've had, you know, way, like way more privileges. Like my dad is a professor. I was traveling around the country thanks to his job because he's presenting at conferences or whatever, you know, and like I traveled out of the country when I was in high school because he presented like at a conference in Germany, you know, and so like I've had those experience yet at the same time, we weren't doing that out of our own pocket. Like I can't ever, go, I'm like, I'm not about to go only $400 about anything. And I'm like on, I'm not gonna say the more privileged in a black, of African American in America, but like my experience is not, you know what I mean? So so for you to be like, okay, black Americans are, you know, like your experience with black with African Americans are in these like specific verified spaces because how many African Americans are in international schools? You know, your experiences with African Americans are in posh hotels during business meetings with CEOs. And what you are is resentful because, quote unquote, my Oxford degree doesn't give me as much privilege as an American passport. Well, and also, hold on. So let's have this moment about this African American versus Black American definition. Because I've been told more than once that we're not African American. Mm, Our people okay. aren't from Africa well, we're anytime not recently. Africa, yeah. Right. <sighs> and <laughs> thus, we are black. And then I was told we weren't. We weren't even black. I was told we weren't even black, and I so can tell what? you exactly. And I'm gonna call this name Cola Booth. I got jumped up talking about how we weren't black. Oh no, Cola Booth told okay. me specifically that I was not black directly on my fucking Twitter because I have a white mother. She told me just, oh, well then you're not black. But she is both African and Black American by virtue of being adopted by African Americans. So she gets to take yeah, we're both the African American title, the Black American title, and the Sudanese and whatever she was from title. But I can't even by virtue claim blackness just by having a white mom, regardless of my experience can of living in this country. Period. Well, you know, let's can we just say here, if you're slave well, descended? Then you're not black as far as she's concerned. So I'm what? Also, also, can we? So none of us are black, technically. Basically, wonder what the fuck we are. Then I mean, can I be clued in? Yeah. What do you call us? Yeah, but I mean, but I think Cola Booth is a perfect example of folks who are supposedly for us who aren't necessarily for us, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, well, and this is the we, thing. We talk about the game, and sometimes we're right, but most of the times, you know. We ahead. have, Cola Booth and I have butted heads a couple times, um, and she wound up blocking me eventually, because I really will sit here and argue with you forever if I don't have anything better to do or if I'm just in a boring meeting. And one of the things that was interesting mm -hmm. was that after we were done interacting, people came to defend her point and to tell me that we don't have a right as African Americans, as black Americans, as whatever, to define blackness, to own blackness because oh. we're here and we're not part of there and that really belongs to Africans. And we won't talk about my first, te my first re tweeted response because, well, you can guess what it was. Um, <laughs> it was very feminist. 
<laughs> we got somebody on the Sometimes. tag talking about how basically it's a it's an issue of responsibility again to train your immigrant mm-hmm. black children to not be African American because then that's mm-hmm. a lower class kind of a black. Yeah. For yeah don't bag your pants. Don't yeah. speak like them niggas. Don't be lazy. You know. Mm-hmm. Don't fucking stay around the hood. Don't, don't be the out. image that the U.S. pushes of black Americans. That's really all that means at the end of the fucking mm-hmm. day. Don't be, you know, the whatever, the 90s uh, boys in the hood, um, you know, just whatever. <laughs> there is a right, and there. this is the thing. You know? I they, know exactly they, what you mean. People will literally watch whatever these movies are. When I was living in Germany, there were so many, oh my god, you are, you're not what I expected, conversations that Listen. really boiled down to, I have seen Ooh. these movies. These movies taught me this. These movies are maybe not reality. Um, but when you talk to them about the movies they've been watching, they're all American movies. Mm-hmm. And let me also just say what gets exported is not what you would expect. It is mm-hmm. not, um, you know, you're not seeing Roots or 12 Years a Slave <laughs> or whatever getting that same push that you can find for New Jack City. Yeah. Or uh, boys in the hood, or and I mean, literally, yeah. I've had people just start imitating voices from one of these movies, and I'm looking at them like, I don't. What are you doing? I mean, the sad thing is, is though, this has happened to me in America because I've never traveled, <laughs> you know, outside. I've been to Canada, but that was before <laughs> you needed a passport when you had, you could use your birth certificate. So, um, you know, they they do this to you in America. Um, I know a girl who was in the military who said she had a boy who was in, it was, you know, the military is very segregated. I'm sure you know that, Vicky. But yeah. Um, oh, God, yeah. it was a mostly black group. And this, they had one white boy who was, who wanted to kill himself because he literally had never met black people and only knew what he had seen on TV from the images of American movies. And he was so in fear of his life, literally, that we were so violent and so mm-hmm. terrible by what he had seen that he was on suicide watch. That well, actually doesn't nobody, surprise me. I bet you nobody, man, ever laid a hand on that fool. No, they didn't. Of course not, you know. Ever. <laughs> I well, no, okay, because our people... Wait, I just have to have this I, moment. Okay. Here's the thing yes, it doesn't no, surprise get me. Up, I... Because because I was in the military with someone with several people who came to tell me all about how they'd never talked to a black girl before and never had sex with a black girl before or something never whatever with a black girl. And let me tell you something about that never had sex with a black girl. You still ain't gonna have sex with a black girl, so get the hell away from it. But <laughs> one of the things that was interesting, because I first traveled outside the country um, with my aunt, I didn't have a passport, but that was back in birth certificate days and we took a cruise and we went to Canada and whatever, and my aunt single woman took me with her so she had a traveling companion a couple times and these were still trips saved up for over a space of years and whatever but my first time really going across the water as my grandmother would say was while I was in the military and getting a passport after having used a military ID to travel is very interesting because it's one thing when I was traveling with Uncle Sam where I was staying in the barracks and I could eat at the chow hall and it really cost me no money going abroad on a passport and having to pay for that hotel and all the food and all of these things and doing it that first time as an adult responsible for all my own expenses, even if you afford a passport, affording the travel to go with the passport is an entirely separate experience. And yes. then even if you afford that travel and whatever, I know we all know those narratives around certain places and oh that's scary and yada yada. I, when I went to Baltimore for work Everybody warned me about West Baltimore and East Baltimore and blah, 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 and Baltimore and Baltimore. And I was like, I'm from Chicago. I'll be all right. Oh. I'll make it. I'll be okay. And I still got stopped by the cops in Baltimore because I was in the fancy neighborhood in a hoodie. And that was what, you know. And so I am literally looking at all of this and I am saying, like, when I have these conversations and people talk about, oh, well, you privileged black Americans. I'm like, well, it's a little more nuanced than that because the black Americans who get to leave, who get to travel, are a highly limited portion of the population. Thank you. There are people in Chicago right now who have never left their neighborhood to speak up. Thank you. Like, they can barely afford bus fare downtown and back again, never mind travel. 
Yeah. My I, shit, okay. it was my cousin's twenty eighth birthday and it was the first time she'd ever stayed in a hotel. And this was a hotel, you know, right next to the hood, but it's her twenty eighth birthday. She just stayed in a hotel for her first time ever. You know what I mean? Like and I just wanna get this out because I can't I'm I'm up in the air about the passport situation. Like if you're a convicted felon, you have to go through even more things. And people want to talk about privileged black Americans or African Americans, but there are over a million African Americans in jail right now and there are even more who are on probation and parole and who have these records who don't have access to the same things. So to act like we're going to completely ignore these systems that restrict our movement. I mean, like Right now, my brother's on probation. He can't leave the state without permission. Not the state. Mm-hmm. Without permission. So so to to say these things without understanding just the reality of what that is, you know, like I had to get, I had to take a piss test. I had to get all special permission to go on a, cru- a cruise when I was on probation. Um, They were going to tell my mom, fuck that. Who cares about the money you spent? Put it hot side. If you don't do X, Y, Z, you cannot go. And they without that in perspective, you know, like these people just sound like they're talking out their ass. Everything they say is just fluff and you are just an asshole. <laughs> well, and also, let's talk about, about that like... from the record. Let's talk about the criminal... Sorry, Lassa. I just have to say this too. Let's talk about the criminal record and stop and frisk for a real quick second. Mm-hmm. Having a criminal record in America is not hard to do as a black person. Nope. Because it's stop and frisk hey. in New York and comment cards in Chicago and whatever they call it in L.A., and cops plant things. I live in a city where a cop shot a girl in the head with an unregistered gun while he was drunk. And the Fraternal Order of Police are arguing that he should not be punished for doing what he was trained to do. I live in a city where they tortured people for years. The Burge torture cases, my city is still paying out settlements for those cases. And they don't know that all of it has been caught yet. I live in a city where they framed a 7 and 8 year old boy for a, a, a girl's rape and murder and were only willing to let that go after the DNA test proved it and it ruined those boys' lives. So when we talk about criminal records, please understand having a conviction doesn't mean you committed a crime if you mm, like. No. Okay, this is this is where the, the the American imperialism and the whole black American thing like okay, there's connections here and I mean, it's not just, you know, in black America. I feel like um, black America um, is subject to the same colonial shit that basically Latin Americans are. And, I mean, it, it started in Latin America, actually, and it was t- brought over to you, and then you guys, like, the, the, the American, like, government basically just made it, like, a freaking, you know, like, an industry. Yeah. A global fucking industry. So I was just watching a video, like... I don't know, a half hour ago, this guy in the Dominican Republic is a comedian, but he's like, he's not joking. He's talking about, like, how black men are treated in the capital. And I'm just like, Jesus fucking Christ, this is the same fucking thing everywhere. Now, mind you, I'm a black woman. Even women in my family who were upper class did not believe me that I was married when I had my baby. Okay. Everybody also assumed I was a teen mom. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with a teen mom. Teen moms are the best ever. God bless them or whatever. Like... But I'm just saying, like, these are the perceptions, even among Dominicans. And this guy's talking about, like, don't put your hand in your pocket at a bank as a black man because tons of black men in the Dominican Republic have died because they were assumed to be criminal and were shot dead. And they're like, if you're a whiter man, you can walk in there and you can be assumed to just be getting a deposit or getting a fucking credit card. But you'll be fucking shot if you're black. If you're shot and you're, and you're for, if you're, like, black and you're riding in the back of a car you know, at night in a public car, nobody's going to get in there with you because they're just going to assume you're a fucking mugger. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it's like all this kind of shit, and it's like, is that familiar at all to you? You know what I'm saying? Like, Ooh. it is actually, like, global, and it, like, affects absolutely mm-hmm. everything. And basically, people come off, and it's like they think that they will divest themselves from it, but it's like it doesn't It doesn't come off because you're still fucking black, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. But I mean, it, it goes fucking deep as fuck. You have and to I just have know. feelings about this whole like this whole like this idea about again the just you know just like people not being able to do a power analysis anymore. Anyway. Like I don't know like if it's just like I don't know what it is, but it seems like people can't actually like let's talk about like the difference between you know like being president of the United States and being like Jerome who, you know, still hasn't gone outside of 285 his whole life. 
like, and, and this assumption that somehow black Americans control the media. Like, I feel like I hear a lot of, like, it's this weird, it's just, it's so, it's kind of like two sides of the same coin, where, like, on one hand, there's this, like, anti-blackness that gets spread globally due to American media, right, like, we've been talking about, and it goes to this, it goes around the world, and then when anti-black things happen, it's like this gaslighting thing where it's like, oh, well, that's not like, no, it doesn't really occur in this country, that's just Americans being, mm -hmm. you know, overly concerned with racism. Like, that's just a Western thing. And I feel like I've heard this, like, if, like, there was something that happened in, like, I think it was, like, Australia, where there was, like, some blackface thing that happened, and, like, I, yeah, like, Harry Connick Jr. was, like, a judge on this, like, talent show, and there were, like, these five guys who did Jackson 5 tribute, and they did they dress up as Jack Black and blackface, and Harry Connick Jr., like, gave them zero points, because he was just, like, what the fuck? Good. <laughs> like, Harry. <laughs> oh, Harry. <laughs> and, they, and the response was just, like, oh, well, that's Harry Connick being an American. And then there was this thing in Korea where there was these anti-black ads where it's like a Korean woman wearing an Afro wig and like charcoal black face mm -hmm. and like lips painted red to sell some hair product. And then when there was pushback, the response was, oh, that's just Americans, you know, like being well, concerned about and racism. Like, let's have this moment. Let's have this yeah, moment no, about the idea that black is global. American. Can we just like own that shit that anti-blackness is global? Right. It's global. It's global. It's global. You're not going to fucking argue that shit away. Jesus fucking Christ. No. These know? people have never heard of neoliberalism <laughs> or globalization. Like, that's what I well, feel like. Connected to what Zahira is saying, these people have never heard of neoliberalism or globalization or the ways that, yes, we have these torture devices that we've tested on people in Latin America, and it's mostly people who are dark Latin Americans. We've imported this to places all around the world, and that, you know what I mean, that happening doesn't mean that black Americans are behind that, that means that these are mechanisms that are connected on this very messed up scale that's blown up since the Reagan area area era that's like that that's it's gotten absurd it's huge and the ways you know these are all connected people would like to have this power analysis and talk about privilege and oppression but then not be able to see the ways that all of these systems are so very connected and stop somehow. talking about privilege we need to stop talking about privilege we need to stop talking about privilege yeah. Because a lot of this thing about privilege is a way for divesting the conversation from these are the actual effects of the things that are happening to be about let's talk about why it's so hard for me to have a better life than you. And a lot of the things that about these issues are is that it's an excuse. No one wants to talk about the larger things, and the reason we're having these conversations and having these G chats is because we have to. We are required to develop skills of decoding and deconstructing on high levels via our life experience just to survive just to survive in a basic kind of form. And we're not having power analysis, and we're not having mm -hmm. these discussions because nobody wants to talk about, or we want to talk about, but people are unprepared. A huge part of what I think has been happening over this time, especially when it comes to analysis and the position of black women with analysis, is that folks were doing the most facetious things they could and got shocked when black women had a deeper analysis, but nobody wanted to talk about why we needed to have a deeper analysis. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about why the idea of Black, yes, blackness and blackface is everywhere. Flavia is like still this. doing things on um, Zwarte Pete. Zwarte Pete. And oh, it's yeah, not just, yeah. but here's the thing, it's not just Zwarte Pete, although let's be clear, Zwarte Pete came from minstrel shows. Zwarte Pete comes from a book that came out shortly after the, uh, the Egyptian, I forget the name of the, the, the troop that traveled, because oh, there no, were a bunch of troops that traveled. They traveled not just to the Netherlands, not just to the UK, not just to France. They were global. They traveled widely. Yeah. They were a big deal in the 1840s, from 1845 to I want to say 1869 or so. It was big time entertainment. It faded a little bit after Reconstruction. Then it came back. You still had television shows using blackface in the UK in the 1970s. There was an episode of Are You Being Served, which I have not been able to find, but a friend of mine is going to send it to me, that closes out in the late 70s with them doing blackface. This is not something that other countries don't know existed. This is not something other countries didn't participate in. They had the books. They had the shows. They had their own versions. You can find footage from Australia's early film industry with dun, 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 blackface. blackface. 
Also, while we're talking, like we and do this- know what happened to the indigenous population of Australia to make Australia okay. And also, this like just this idea that Black Americans are somehow in charge of this like machine and have power over it is just so completely off base. Like, like I remember, like you know, first of all, if you like, if, I don't know, like if you're in the bubble, if you're if you know, if you can't even like go outside your city, like let alone your country, but even so, like you, we really have no idea like how much America is like so centered everywhere else. And I feel like I've been in these spaces where people are resentful for it, and like rightfully so, but it's just kind of like, we don't have control over that. We don't even know. Like, I remember when I went to Germany, like, we we were shocked. We were just like, it's like we're at home. We can listen to all the same songs. We don't even hear, like, local German artists. Like, the, you know, I walked into a store and they were playing, like, a music video by Pink. That's when I realized she was a white woman because I didn't realize that before then. Random. So, but like, look at it like a case of, like, you know, like, look at, like, rap. Like, look at hip hop. Like, Two Chains was talking about how. You know a song, I'm gonna be fresh as hell in the feds. Watch. He was like, I got beef for that line. Like Pharrell was like, yo, I actually don't know if like you should put this, you know, like in your song. Like, I don't know if you should, you know what I mean? Like DJ Drama had a SWAT team bust in on him at his home because of some mixtapes. Yeah. Not because he was selling drugs, not because he was trafficking young girls, not because he was dropping drones for mixtapes. So how you expect, like, when the rapper, like, 2 Chainz, who I'm pretty, like, is one of the highest grossing artists of this year, at least one of the most popular, how if he can't even say, I'm be fresh as hell, the feds watch, he's not even making a commentary on the feds. Like, he's just saying, like, oh, well, if they're watching me, I'm going to be cute, I'm going to look good. Like, if he can't even say that on, like, in America, how the hell do you expect him to be able to, like, go to Europe or wherever else and, like, be like, well, actually, guys, we need to, like, change the PlayStations and make it so that we hear, like, more local artists and then we need to, like, you know, stop being such a colonizing, you know, like, who owns music companies? I mean, but, so here's the thing. I am about to show my age. I see. Cop killer. Remember that song? If you don't remember that song, it's okay. Ice right? tea? But ice is light, bright, damn near white looking. This man had worked as a pimp. Him for that. And he released that song and Ice Tea went in a heartbeat because when he was pimping black women or talking about pimping black women, they loved him. Yep, they did. When he released Cop Killer, you Personally. literally saw every body flip. I'm going to post that song. Right? Yep. Yeah. And the thing that was bizarre to me, he's doing this in an era, like, yes, gangs and drugs and violence and whatever, but also the cops are getting busted literally, it seems like, every day in one city after the next for abuses, mm-hmm. for killing someone. Like, there had been a lot. There has been a lot. And I'm in one of the cities he was referencing in that song. I'm in Chicago. Um... But you couldn't turn on the news without hearing something related to police brutality. And when we have these moments, when we talk about this, let's also talk about, because one of the things I hear a lot about is the hypervisibility of black American women. And I'm always like, well, sort of, because Rekia Boyd got shot in the head and nobody cared. Mm -hmm. Renisha McBride got shot in the head and almost nobody cared. You know, we have a list of names where the cops... You know, Ayana was burned alive and then shot. Her daddy was forced to down in handcuffs his face in her blood and then come to find out they had the wrong house. Like, if we can't even keep people from killing us here, if we can't stop them from killing us here, how are we supposed to stop them from killing people anywhere else? They use our bodies as practice first. Like all these systems of techniques and surveillance, where do you think they were working on that first? Well, not just that. When we talk about (laughs) techniques of torture, when we talk about techniques of testing on on populations, Tuskegee happened here. Mm -hmm. Tuskegee happened here. Okay? It did not happen in a remote back of the whatever area. They built an entire institute. This went on through generations. People knew that syphilis had a cure and did not tell these people that they were passing down tertiary syphilis to their children. Mm -hmm. Babies were being born with damaged vision. Um, 
limited cognitive capacity, all of that. That happened in America to American citizens. Not that being black in America and a descendant of slaves makes you the same kind of, of citizen as anybody else's citizenship because no, we had not. moved. We, we have had, um, I don't know if I've ever told this story. I was on the bus one day coming home from work and old, old men talk to me. I don't know why they like to tell me things. So I'm on the bus, like and this man, I, basically, he starts talking to me, and he tells me this story about the cops going into the house of a panther, not anyone anybody really knows, but them going into his house in the middle of the night. He was still a kid when this happened. Them going into the house, the noise of them busting it down woke him up, and them dragging this man out and killing him in the street and shooting his pregnant girlfriend. They killed him, her, the baby, cleaned everything up, and left. And he had never talked about that because having just seen the cops come in and execute an entire family, shockingly, he hadn't yeah, said a lot about that for years. Sure. And, you know, I just, and again, this goes back to those, like... Just like the, the, the whole, like, again, we can talk about I have a Jones. Everyone can sort of use these, like, political frameworks that were kind of developed not only for African Americans, but also but by black Americans. Like, mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey was not African American. Um, I feel like a lot of, I've also seen in some spaces, like, there being this sort of resentment for African Americans for, like, pan-Africanism. Like, oh, pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism doesn't work. Da, 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 da. Okay, do you know who developed Pan-Africanism? And why, why, why are we? Why are there only African Americans? Like, and you know, I mean, that African Americans when they were there, when you know all these people. Yeah. Well, and even with Don't that, when we talk about things, concepts like Pan-Africanism or intersectionality or all of these concepts, oh, like God. the people at the time made these, no, we came up with these things them. in a framework. As, as part of a framework of what was going on, right? No, can so, I have a moment about intersectionality? I need to have a moment about intersectionality. Okay, you might talk about Kimberly Crenshaw being erased. Please I know. Do. Okay. Kimberly Crenshaw is a law professor. Intersectionality was developed as a law theory, and I have seen at least two articles written by usually Eastern European white men talking about Marxism and sectarianism around intersectionality. And look at what happens. A black woman, a brilliant black woman's very specific theory to handle intelligently a very specific kind of double jeopardy about the bodies of black women is erased from her discussion about this thing. It is then taken and used in ways that it was not originally intended, that she did not develop for by people who don't necessarily understand it but like saying the name of it. And now it's being critiqued for not applying to things like economy and socialism <laughs> that she never intended. But somehow she gets all of the blame, none of the credit when people are taking it and using it positively, and it's being used to justify why they don't have to handle the fractures and problems within their movements and their movements' ineffectiveness at dealing with actual diversity, and that's why they're failing. People are talking about, well, nobody wants to be part of our movement anymore, and that's because these sects have divided and we're not together anymore. I'm not, nobody wants to come to a table where they're actually, every single day when they're going to be asked to eat off the floor. People don't want to go to your movement because there's no voices like theirs, there's nobody there who represents them, and their interests don't come up. We started talking about feminism. People are screaming about, we don't have enough feminist voices, people don't represent us, bobbity bobbity boo and you constantly get this thing... You said bobbity bobbity boo <laughs> You constantly get this thing of, when was the last time you talked about something or mobilized on something that I cared about? When was the last mm -hmm. time? We basically saved your asses for that Virginia gubernatorial race, but I don't see any femi feminist mobilization on the Voters' Rights Act. No. Or the voters' rights schools. amendment. Schools. 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 Or schools. Let me just jump in here. Schools. 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 Oh, schools. oh. Before I forget, though, uh, especially Sadet. When Patricia Hill Collins came to talk, I think she and her, I think her and Kimberly Crenshaw are working on something to address exactly that because they're sick of that shit too. And Patricia Hill yes. Collins said, I think they're getting together because they said they had a meeting and I think some stuff is coming out. So, you know, like, we they have to be on the lookout. They can read Marx. They can read Ingalls. They can all the blippity blappity bloop. They can go into the footnote number 12 and so and so who came back and said this. I haven't read a word, Du Bois. 
haven't read a word well, of Claudia Jones. Here's I haven't the thing. read a word of Jones. I have more. Like I have had fourteen conversations about Ida B. Wells. And I and I mean fourteen. Million probably. And it's always the same, oh I had no idea. But you, you just said you knew all about feminist history. Now I know if you Google this, that, the other, you can find lynching. I need them. To, I need people lot. with master's degrees to stop pretending they don't know about history and start admitting they just didn't look and they just didn't care. I was yeah. gonna say I don't know about not looking. They looked. They didn't care. You can find Ida B. Wells crashing a freaking white feminist march. I mean, even if you ain't looking up lynching, you can find out about her coming into y'all parties because y'all denied her. <laughs> Let's talk about Ida B. Right. Wells for you know, her YouTube. No, we were talking about internationally. Like, Let's talk crazy. about how she did on her this... trip to England and how they wanted to shut her down. And why? Because they didn't believe her commitment to feminism was good enough. Why didn't they believe her femi- commitment to fe- feminism wasn't good enough? Because, number one, she got married and she had some babies. And number two, she was talking too much about the lynching of black men and black women, which people like to forget. So because she wanted people like her to stay alive, she wasn't a good feminist. What does that sound like? Same shit. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And another thing I would well, like and to... This is it. No, let, just let me finish okay. this one. Because this is something that's also starting to pop up. I'm going to need people to stop looking at the intersectional experiences of black women and turning it around and wondering why the black community doesn't do more for them in certain cases, but not asking the members of the feminist community or the progressive community or the liberal community who have many more resources the same question. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Because well, see, here's what I want to know. I want to know as we come to black women again and again and again and again, like I, I've had the woman of color conversation and I put I linked to that video from Loretta Ross. And we say, well, why didn't you do this this way? Why didn't you include us here? Why didn't you create some why did you create something that was explicitly for you? I started tweeting about R. Kelly the other night and uh-huh. how he preyed on young black girls in mm-hmm. Chicago. And uh-huh. it turns out he preyed on young black girls in a lot of places. But I was specifically talking because I know about him in Chicago. I was one of the black girls he hit on at 14. I was one of the girls who saw him hanging around on 53rd when I was 12. Like, I, I was talking about that. And people came to me and said, well, it wasn't, this isn't just black girls that experience this kind of thing. Nobody asked you. What? I didn't ask you a, look, look. I said <laughs> talking R. about R. black Kelly? girls being preyed on. <laughs> I made R. five Kelly? tweets. Five what? tweets. Five. Five tweets. And then someone was coming to tell me about how it happens to all children. But when did R. Kelly ever specifically touch anybody who wasn't black? As we were talking about R. Kelly. You got the facts and that logic. I didn't uh, told you about uh, them uh, in this guest list. I didn't told you about them in this guest list. Because he knew he get smashed up in a hot minute. Exactly. He was going to jail if that little girl was for no damn 14, 12 year old <laughs> white girls. Are you kidding me? No, R. Kelly and R. Kelly could be found. He could actually be found. I could tell you the actual location. Um... Rock and roll McDonald's. McDonald's used to be on 53rd. You could find him at the Burger King by UIC. Like, there are actual spots that were his favorite spots. If you went to Julian, there was a couple places by Julian. If you went to Kenwood, if he wasn't at McDonald's, he was literally at Kenwood itself. Like, if he was around Whitney Young, he was at that Burger King because he couldn't go to Bobby's because Bobby's, the restaurant where most of the kids hung out, were where the cops from the police academy down the street hung out. Like, I will literally call this man's name and the places he frequented. Okay, and I am talking about this, and I have R. Kelly stands telling me it didn't happen. I have women confessing that R. Kelly bothered them, that they know someone, that they went with him, that someone they know went with him, whatever. Because also, black women above a certain age in Chicago, it got to the point where I feel like we all had to go through the R. Kelly gauntlet just by virtue of of law of averages. Like you were gonna be some uh, one of these places, and. People literally could not handle me having that conversation about the ways in which black girls are harmed any broader than like a specific this R. Kelly incident happened here because I started to talk about the fact that like he was able to get away with it for so long because that was two tweets, two whole tweets about black girls and being victimized at a higher percentage under certain under a certain age, and this is how this happens, and then there were people in my mentions insisting that I talk about something else that I open the door to all these other issues. What, and what did I, I about those people? What did I tell you? I tried to kill one. I tried to reach you, my damn monitor. Jamie had to talk to me. Jamie had to literally call me up and be like, Mickey, Mickey, close it, close it, close it. Because I she can usually tell when I'm about to start stabbing people. 
And this was the thing, though, because when we start talking about what black women should do, shouldn't do, you get mad that black women are doing for themselves. You get mad that black women are taking care of home. Because, again, you have mammy issues, mammy issues, mammy issues. Did I say mammy issues? Because I want you to understand I'm saying mammy issues. Mammy issues. When you see black women talking about who is preying on them and who is victimizing them, let's be real honest. For most of us growing up in a semi-segregated community, that's going to be black men. If it's not black men, it's going to be other men of color and white men under a certain age. Over a certain age is white men. That's a separate conversation. But we're talking about the 40 to 60 percent under 18. Most of us are living in segregated areas. We are being victimized by people in our community, and we cannot address that for you, you, you. We have to address that for us. And the men we are trying to address get off the hook in part because you run in to tell us to talk about something else right along with them. That's your feminism. There are white women in my mentions immediately every time I talk about what happens to black girls to tell me about how it happens to other people. And it's not just black girls. And what about these other things? And I'm like, but I'm talking about this. Why don't okay take, but about here's that. my question. Why don't you take it to one of your feminist leaders? Why don't you take it to the, net, the person who wrote the 34th article on Miley Cyrus and her children? Take it to the person who's who's falling on her sword to develop to de, to defend Lily Allen. Take it to somebody talking about lean in or something of the else. Why are you bringing it to our house? And I know you're going to say mammy issues. I know you're going to say mammy issues. But let's 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 address this because there's this consistent desire that we do work for no pay to augment the fact that they don't want to address the people who are not doing the work that they are paying for, like. There was like the person who was my favorite person, and mm -hmm. talking about how let's talk about how you're asking women to, or we're not talking about the privilege and the commodity that has become feminism. They were not talking about the commodity that has become nonprofits. They we're not talking about how we have commodified speaking about certain issues and not speaking about certain issues with a complete and utter dishonesty. And we're also not talking about how even after all of that, you're not doing it. But you want to have all of these groups, women of color, black women, trans women, immigrant women, pick up the slack for the work you're not doing. Because no one's sitting here talking about why, why you, they haven't heard anything, even though it doesn't now have headquarters in Chicago. Then wasn't there a big meeting in Chicago about all of this? But everybody has to tell Mickey why she needs to be talking about this. And, you know, because it's profitable. Like, it's profitable in multiple ways. Like, the whole, you know, like, we can't talk about this because, you know, because people keep rushing in and say, you should talk about something else, because if we start talking about that, eventually someone's bottom line is going to be messed with. Like, R. Kelly was in part, I mean, you know, it's an abuse culture, and so, you know, abusers are always able to utilize the resources around them to, um, you know, shield themselves. But he was defended in part because he was, you know, uh, he, there's people in the music industry that he makes a lot of money for. Like, he's making some rich white people even richer, um, and in a way, wider by dint of is sexual abuse towards black women, and and so I've, and also you know like like Sadat, what's the name of the um, the mistress in Twelve Years a Slave, Mary? Mary Epps. Yes, like the Mary Epps feminism thing, because it's not just like oh you know like there's structural things too, but there's also like libidinal things. There's like libidinal economy there, right? Like there's actual pleasure in like you know, sort of tearing open black flesh. Like, there's, and you know, this, and you know, they, they actually, like, they would have, and this was in the Caribbean, and probably in the States too, but, you know, seeing people die is a form of, it, seeing black people die has been a form of entertainment in this country for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Seeing black people die has been a form of entertainment for this hemisphere for a very long time. Like, there were dogs 
that were trained to tear apart black people specifically during slavery. Like and to the and you know and the the training process for these dogs, I gotta find this article it was ridiculous. Like you know they'd like make a figurine out of like meat or something and like paint it black to try and like train the dog to like go for darker skin. Of course, what ends up happening is that you just basically create savage ass dogs to the point that like when the when they were like released to dogs or dogs would come, like people would have to go inside of their houses at a certain point because they would just attack anyone. But even though it put them in that danger, it was still worth it because it was just yes, that is. What is it? You train the dog to attack people, and soon you have to go inside their house because it's just going to attack everybody that walks. Mm. And I think that's it in a nutshell. Like, that's just the whole relationship of anti-blackness in a nutshell. Like, you think it's just going to end up in one, like, thing, but then it ends up affecting everything else. But, you know, so the idea that, like, you know, this sort of, um, I remember, you know, someone, actually it was James Bliss made a post, like, a year or so ago talking about, like, the like there's not only a pleasure in enacting racism, there's a pleasure in denying that you're, like, enacting racism, right? Like, it's not just, like, oh, like, oh, there's this, you know, like, the family dog is, like, you know, the sweet, kind, friendly dog who also doubles as, like, the attack dog on black bodies. So there's, like, a comfort there, there's a pleasure there, there's all these things going on, and, you know, like, I think it's definitely structural, but I think you know, they also get a sense of self from, like, our disembodiment, whether it's, like, literal or figurative, you know, or metaphor. Mm. Yeah, well, that's why and, I think a know, lot of the... Act like they do, but, you know, they do. Yeah. That's they why class, solely, solely class analysis, like, we need to add class, but only on its own. It never makes sense, you know, because there's very psychological elements that are going on, um, you know, that are, uh, when it comes to racism, when it comes to anti-blackness specifically, and when it comes to anti-black misogyny, especially because of the ways that people feel so <laughs> entitled to the black women's body, including um, so many other black men. I mean, you know, when you were talking about the tearing open of the flesh, like, I thought of that Sartre Bartman cake, and how how um, how happy those people looked while they were eating the cake and cutting the cake while there were literally screams of a black woman playing that were supposed to, uh, uh, you know, show that she was being cut open, that this was painful. And this is, this was 2012, you know, so it's, it's, this is something that's very, it's, it's even deeper than just what is profitable and what is um, economically good for white people or white community or whiteness, um, it's, it's very psychological as well. Mm. Can we also talk about the fact that um, with the R. Kelly shit, there was people within the community who basically just, when it comes to black girls, like mm. even black Ooh. people don't understand that we're human and that we can be innocent and that we can be abused. Yes. So, I mean, everyone was like, so mm -hmm. she wanted it. I mean, shouldn't she just okay, move out of the way? It. You know, if she doesn't want to be pissed on or some shit, it's like, you know, this People is have started that and I just a child. Away. I can't, and it's I like, can't. you know, the fact is that the same black men who were all, oh my God, prison industrial, stop and frisk, blah, 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 are like, so rape them when it comes to yeah. black girls. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. I mean... It extends to where, you know, other people of color kind of, like, project that shit onto black women anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's yeah. not even just white people. Like, it just ends up being, like, everyone. And, like, where black men will see each other as human, they won't see us. Yeah. yeah. Even black yeah. women. Because, you and know, other like, black women, yeah. yeah. They'll play, they'll do remember, the same shit. remember that case in Texas where it was black men who gang raped a young 11 year old black girl, and it was other women who were quoted saying, well, she was dressed this way and she was wearing this makeup, and oh, please don't harm our black men because they go through this, that, and the third. Who cares that it was 18 to 22 year old men attacking mm -hmm. and raping an 11 year old girl? So, I black mean, there's girl. a specific uh, joy out of, uh, you know, kind of tearing up black girl flesh, <laughs> really. Uh, we get the worst yeah. of, the of just black anti-blackness and sexism, like, on our bodies equals basically, like, you know, I can tear you up, and, and that's cool, because it doesn't fucking matter. Like, you know? 
That's why my black feminist teacher, she says that black girls are the, the least protected and least safe people in this, you know, in this Western Hemisphere, pretty much. And, well, and that's where we get to the strength thing, because people say that we're so strong, there's no way it matters what happens to us, right? Mm -hmm. I admire your strength has become code for I can feast oh my on God. you, can I not and it doesn't matter. Again? And like, and it's a thing I struggled with because when I first met my husband, Patrick treats me like I'm little and fragile and yada yada yada, right? And it drives me crazy sometimes. And then other times I realize that part of that is because he's the first person to actually say, "Are you okay? Do you, are you comfortable? Do you feel okay?" Like that expectation of strength is not always there. And we used to really beef over it, but like as I sit back and I watch and I have these interactions online, there is this bizarre, bizarre thing where like people will watch a black girl being jumped basically, verbally just assaulted and whatever, and her people, her friends will rep for her, but that's it, right? White women who rush to defend white feminists when they're being attacked you can't find them with this black girl. You can't find them for when we when the um, the, the con comment was made about Kavandane. Mm. I had white women defending that comment to me. Mm. Let's like, get it's really a honest. joke. Let, let's get, let, well, let's bring it even more recently. Let's talk about feminist selfies in a second. Even though Jamie Ooh. don't know what she's having technology. About. Well, let's talk about this. Actually, let me have this moment because we did the feminist selfies and the, the person who wrote the feminist selfies are a cry for help article went into um, what I termed a, a deep and abiding, oh, well, people are picking on me. And she hinted at the, you know, the mean black girls, the mean, the mean girls are ganging up on me. And she talked around it, and people talked about her being harassed and whatever. And I go and I look at her mentions, and unless a whole bunch of stuff was deleted, not so much. Um, but on top of that, when I responded, when I said, well, hold on, you say that, you know, no harm intended doesn't mean no harm done. The same can be said of your article. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. And then all of a sudden, so that has jumped in, and we're both going at it. The next day, we're backpedaling, and oh, I never thought of it that way, and whatever. But... You were really ready to have like the hounds unleash on Jamie. You were ready for that. You were ready to set this, frame this out as though she's the person picking on you, whatever. She but okay, you'll make me come over there. We had a, and let's also talk about this, and I'm going to be circumspect because I do have some political savvy, but mm -hmm. notice how some people will talk about being for feminists and being for liberal politics, but when it comes to being for feminists, they never show up for black women, but give them 10 seconds, they're always there for the white girl? Mm. Mm. Oh, you don't even got to be white, because I mean, when that Indian girl, uh, basically... The same one who did that stupid Rihanna roundtable where they didn't know shit about black women or our context or anything. Um, yeah, she um, kind of went into more stuff about, she wrote an article about the whole Lily Allen stuff. But like, mm -hmm. it was basically her regurgitating the conversation that we had as black women on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You know? And then not naming any black women whatsoever. It was like her creation or some shit. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is the thing I think a lot of people don't really talk about is that often then, when I see thing is when I pointed that out, it took two seconds for seven people to be in my mentions defending her. Okay. Uh, yeah. And this is a brown woman, so I mean, it just doesn't happen mm. for us as black women, okay? Because brown women can have a cavalry too, apparently. You know what I'm but, saying here? But they want us to show up for every single thing, but it's kind of like, so even when we're sitting here screaming, you're always you're only there to tell us to shit, shit, sit down and be quiet. And I've noticed that there's a habit of these people that when they get called out, they make a very big show of, I want to follow you, I want to have a conversation, and then two days later when people are looking elsewhere, they unfollow you, they they're, right back in the bosom, they're right back in the loving bosom of mm -hmm. white feminism, but mm -hmm. they're the first person to tell you about how hard it is to be the only person of color at the table, but... Ooh. They don't want to talk about why exactly how many throats they slit to get at the table. And I'm not talking about the production of work. Like, honest to Pete, 
people are always laughing at me when I say I am never mad at Tana Nisi Coates because he puts out the work. But there are a whole lot of people whose entire career seems to be telling black women to shut up when white women are talking. That is what they do. Mm. That is their contribution to feminism. Mm. Mm. And then they're like, I don't understand why they don't treat me better. Okay. You know, yeah, just this whole, like, again, this respectability of politics, this whole, like, good nigger, bad nigger, like, oh, like, we get angry the right way, you know, we articulate ourselves the right way, you know, we don't, you know, like, we handhold and walk people through and we don't alienate potential allies versus, like, the, oh, you just angry, bitter, ratchet hood, Blah, 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 blah. Never mind that some of these same people who are all like, you know, trying to be the right person have names like Ratchet in their Twitter handles or want to mm -hmm. call them you know, Dr. Ratchet PhD or whatever have you. Um, but can't actually, like, you know, are kinder towards the white women who are abusing them than the black women who are like, but why are you treating us like this? And include that other person in the us. Um, and it's just very interesting to see this happening. Like, you know, just the idea that... And this is happening again while you're, like, quoting Audre Lord. It's like the cognitive dissonance of it. You know what I mean? Like, the master's tools and the digital... Okay, quote to me, like, uses of anger. Oh, they ain't gonna take like, that one with a tent for anything control. Anything else <laughs> than, you know, or better yet, quote to me someone other than Audre Lorde. Quote to me Barbara Jordan. Or no, Barbara Smith. Quote me. Well, but I these are know. the same people who can quote who can quote MLK, but only in the context of I have a dream and I've never read letters from a Birmingham jail. These are the people who will quote that one passage from Audre Lorde, the one passage from Bell Hooks or whatever, but they've never read the book. They know that quote. It's all they know. These are they the people the who will show up. Quite honest. Right. right. Yeah. Well, and these are also the people who will show up and show out for the popular causes, right? They will all be Trayvon. None of them will be mm. Rakia. Mm -mm. Or they'll yeah. only be Rakia after you lay the groundwork or we lay the groundwork for it. Everybody ignores mm -hmm. it, and then a week later they pick it up and be like, so look at this shiny thing I found with our names separated from yes. it. Yes. And this is the thing, because a lot of times when these people come and they want to rescue whoever they're rescuing, they do it in a way where they have alienated however many, however other, many other members of the community, right? But then they come back later and say in a very tragic, tragic way, well, I would do more things, but those people don't like me. Well, hold on. I didn't know who you were until you showed up to CAPE for that. And then having caped for that, and caped for that, and caped for that, I figure your character puts you over there, way over there, you know. And mm -hmm. I've I've certainly noticed too a trend of you can be, and I'm not even gonna say that word that upsets people so much, but you can be the acceptable black or brown person as long as you don't say anything too loud, too mean, too controversial, and everything involves fourteen dollar work. I may never ever use praxis in a sentence. I may not. What can I tell you? I think it's a stupid word. Hey. But I will talk about community. <laughs> look, look. And I may not read all of the obscure random folks, philosophers that you do because, you know, I got babies to raise and food to cook and a job to go to or whatever. But that doesn't mean I'm ignorant. It, it just means I read enough so that I know what the hell is going on, and I don't really feel need to argue Plato with anyone. I read it in high school. I may never go near it again. You'll be all right. And but the things that I write are really course. scarily enough. My my intellectual contributions to feminism will really be aimed at folks who are in the hood, at folks who are with babies on this chat or. Um, getting ready tonight, making them pies and whatever for dinner for tomorrow for their people who are coming over. For those folks who are going to be crashing at someone's house this weekend because, hey, I don't know how to cook, whatever. 
this is not going to be about how can I serve the people who are already being served. It doesn't make any sense to keep focusing on helping those folks at the expense of those folks. That's not feminism. I don't know what that is. They got a lot of names for it, but it whatever. You keep chasing that, and I'm going to be over here with these people. And it's funny because I've had several how did you get so big so fast? Why are you so popular? Whatever conversations. Seriously? And what people don't want to hear is that there's a whole lot more of us than them. Seriously, someone actually said that to you? Mm -hmm. I have all kinds of conversations. Yeah. So um, as, as, as the moderator of this chat, let me point out that it is now 7.57. Our plan to go for an hour was ruined. Ruined. Yeah. Completely and utterly. <laughs> I blame you, Sudette. Well, how do we uh, watch the phones? Huh? You, Sudette, why you. Is, why is this my fault? Because everything is your fault. <laughs> you're how does that even happen? Uh, and if everything's my fault, then also the good things are my fault, and I still don't have pound cake. Oh, no. I have to mail you pound cake. I, have to, I, I actually made pound cake with the yeah, intent of the cakes to I, Daniel. No, no, I made pound we're cake. Talking about make... cake, and they're not talking about sending it to me. This is yeah, true. come on. No, no, no. This this is is we had a Wait, conversation about cake. You. I have to make cake at a weekend when my kids are not home. <laughs> I I make cake. Because I'm going to be boring. I was going to go in the kitchen. I was just out, out today. I feel and like these I was, I'll, ate I'll a cake. variety of choices, even. And I yes. Yeah, let, let me let so what you have to do is come and guard guard the cake. Like it has to be have time to cool and get out of the house. Because <laughs> oh. my fourteen year old son is almost six feet tall and his feet eat everything. I'm just saying, since I'm being blamed for this, <laughs> I've asked for a very traditional southern lemon ice pound cake. Ooh. I've asked for that glory. And I'm not getting it. And there's so many you things that I have been, I've been right before, and I still don't have my pound cake, but I'm going to be blamed for the That's because you ain't worth nothing, woman. I ain't worth Actually, <laughs> seriously, it's now, now cold enough to ship it and be sure that it might actually be handled properly. My mother-in-law works for the post office, and the stories she could tell about where they store things. Wait, wait, wait. You oh, wanted God. me to wait. Stop, stop. So we have we talked about this, and we do have to go. But <laughs> if that being said, we're going to take these last, like, five, seven minutes, and we're going to each say something happy that happened to black girls in this week, in this month, or something, because I'm not leaving it on this note. We did that last time. I'm blaming Jamie for that one where we were talking about the <laughs> FK and the solidarity for white women. We're going to talk about happy black girl stuff. Go. <laughs> uh, and y'all wonder why I worry about this child and her ability to go outside unsupervised. And yet, yet, if you've <laughs> ever been out with her unsupervised, you know it's it's hard to be a five foot ten fairy. It really is. It's rough. <laughs> it's rough being the giant pixie of doom. Okay. <laughs> Sudet That's a skip. perfect description for Samantha. <laughs> Sudet will skip down the damn street just as happy and perky as you please. <laughs> scaring the damn neighbors because she got fairy wings and they looked at her like, bitch, that is not a wing. That, that, I don't know what that is, but it's a sail. Like, I don't, I don't, you're scared. Ow. I've seen you. What happened? When, what happened the last time you went out with me? What actually happened? Tell the tell the crew. Mazahara. Okay, so here's a happy black girl story. Thank so you. So I go with Sudet. I meet Sudet in New York. Me and my husband, and we go to Mazahara Morimoto's restaurant. Mazahara Morimoto is the guy from Iron Chef, the original Iron Chef and the current Iron Chef. We get a table, and as is the luck of all things Pixie, he is seated at the table directly behind ours with his friends in a blue velour tracksuit. Doing sake bombs. I don't know. I can't explain this to you. I want to take a picture. So that won't let me take a picture. That's she tells me that'd be rude. And then he randomly, because we're dancing to this food, because this food is amazing and it's our big special treat. None of us have ever really placed this fancy before. Um, we're dancing to this food, and he stops at the table and chats with us. Just oh look, black girls dancing while they eat. My, how you doing? What y'all doing? <laughs> And he's smiling and looking around like, okay, this is the interesting table. 
<laughs> Look, he he's lucky because if I hadn't been someplace fancy, I would have twerked. I would really, I would I would have been jacking and twerking and just like. <laughs> Because that, oh my god, that oyster appetizer! Oh my god! Oh no! Oh, I'm gonna get girls, oysters. And so, girls, when we get some cash and somebody funds a foundation, I will drag you around New York City for the glory of food. But see, happy black girl moment next. And I may be a pixie if good things happen. Next, this changes the pixie hair. Next, Inasa. I'm trying to think. I mean, it's been a pretty chill week. For me personally, well, something that happened today that made me smile. My mom showed me this twerking video. <laughs> Is it the Korean like, girl twerking? Some, I don't know. No, 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 not the one with the white girl. No, no. no. happy, 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 no. happy. No, that thing did is you happy. See, did that you guys see my in, in my soul? <laughs> Nah, did that's the very dance off link. Did you watch every that? Because I know you lied to me. Like that, I get personally offended. Personally, like no, no, no. Well, they get on the floor. You have to see them get on the floor. It's offended, and then they get on the floor and they do the worm, and it's the best they do thing the I've ever seen. They do the worm. It's like watching, like watching a praying mantis twerk. <laughs> like, it's like watching rows of praying mantises oh. trying to do sexy. It's the white soror praying mantises. It was just like, I mean, and it opens up with a shot of like them going Bless like you, the going over their ass, and it's just like, like it's just like vibrating like like tree limbs in a wind, like little saplings, like the younger trees, and it's like oh, it's a thin kind of awesome. stick, and it's like the wind is blowing, and it's just kind of like, ah, like that's what they look like, and it hurts, it hurts so bad, it hurts so bad, but this was not that. <laughs> okay, good. This was a good video. Laugh. No, this was, I don't even know like who sent it to her, because she showed it to me on her phone, but she was just like, you know, I wasn't really into this twerking thing, but this girl right here. And girlfriend was getting it. She was like, I don't know who or what it was. So I'm like, you know, some girl like I was, you know, sitting by a car and she had like on some jeans, jean shorts, and she was just like really getting it. And I was just like, Mother, I'm so glad we could like appreciate this together. Aww. So that was a nice moment today. He struck. Um, wait, 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 wait. Um, we also have to remember Amber Riley. And she won the stars. Because Kim J just reminded me, and I've been enjoying the hatred that is poured out in response. It's hilarious. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay, can, can, can we have a moment for that thing where for the dudes, and anybody who's watched any of her dances, the faces on some of these young Hollywood white boys watching that bounce and jiggle has been one of the most hilarious aspects of my life. A combination of wait, wait, wait. and perplexed that just lays me out. Okay, let's finish this up. Like they're we... confused that they're attracted. Have, like, like they love it, and they're like, "Oh my god, I had no idea I was going to love this shit." <laughs> like, <laughs> for real. <laughs> like that gif where that guy's looking at Amber all sexy and he like totally um the other dancer I forget his name Val or whatever and I was like hey get it Amber <laughs> was like, there was especially after her final dance there's a there's a moment especially and she brought out that step and I was like I think all of us who've ever done a step team or been Greek all had a moment of like yes Lord but he did that step and there was there was this one young man whose name I don't know but they did the close up and he just looked like like God had been <laughs> him on that day. <laughs> Black girls are magic. That's awesome. Okay, who's next to the positive black girl spirit? Okay. I mean, I guess I've been I've been getting like a decent amount of people who've been interested, like black women who've been helping me with my project. So that's been like a positive thing. And so my master's paper is on black women in predominantly white universities and just what our experiences are and it's a qualitative Mm -hmm. experience project so it's you know it's interviews and I've just been um, you know as as hard as some of it is and knowing like how difficult our reality is just like the actual having black women who've helped me to find each other who has you know volunteered to participate who has 
been there to like schedule, talk to me, do this, be accommodating. Like that's really been just really um that's been really good, I think, a real happy thing lately, yeah. Yay. Oh my gosh. Um I'm gonna be the, the, the boring bitch of the group and just say that um <laughs> Right now, for me, happy Black Girl Story is being at peace and having a non-eventful fucking week. That sounds really mm-hmm. simple, right? Like, you take that shit for granted, but, like, do you know how good that feels when it's not the norm? Mm-hmm. When it's like, oh, hey, like, everything is going okay right now, and just there's nothing, and really, like, boredom is a wonderful thing. I'm just gonna say this, okay? And yeah, that that's a happy black girl moment for um somebody who doesn't get peace. Um, you know? Yeah. So sorry, boring bitch. <laughs> Story. That was boring. I understand the joy of a moment of peace. Mm-hmm. Jamie, you in there? I think the baby has taken Jamie. Oh. <laughs> Like Dexter took Jamie. Yeah, I know. He's just looking at us like <laughs> Dexter does not look amused. <laughs> can we talk about the the lovely little baby who just waved at us from mommy's watching the Google handout hangout? A little baby. Yes. Wait, where? <laughs> Margaret Northwood, her daughter Rose says hi everyone. Cause hi. she's a cutie pie. She looks like a little little angel. Her daughter is much nicer. Her daughter is much nicer than my kid. My kid is outside the door and would like to know when I am getting off the computer. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Jamie's in there. Jamie gets a happy yes. back moment. She just came back. Jamie? Jamie? Jamie's not really here. Her phone didn't die. Uh, you know, yeah, don't believe surprised. the hype. Yeah. Don't believe the hype. Oh, wait. <laughs> also, I just have to, I have to have this one last random thing. Um, I threatened to nom on the knees of my youngest. He looked at me and said, you're a sick, sick girl. And I understand that not everyone will get how funny that was or how great that was, but he has a language processing disorder, and we don't always get intelligible, coherent speech, much less an actual comeback that he made up all by himself. He understood all the words. It was amazing. Even if it did have us all die laughing. <laughs> that was my happy black girl moment of this week. That sounds it was a mom moment too. You'll deal. You'll be alright. <gasps> oh my god. So actually, now that you say that, like my, the other happy moment is, you know, I discovered that cake is a good motivational tool for my kid. Because you know, she's having some sensory issues and stuff and, you know, some hyperactivity and Apparently, bribery with cake and cupcakes and baking is a good thing. This is working. <laughs> you know what? I don't give a fuck. If it works, I don't care. Have cake. Have cake. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> you should get one of those mini <laughs> cupcake pans. <laughs> mini <laughs> cupcake pans. They love those. They think it's so mm-hmm. fun to bake tiny cupcakes, and oh. they don't realize they eat less that way. Yeah, that's what you're enjoying. Can anybody hear me? Yes, yes, yes. This works, man. This works. And look, there's your face. Uh, I know. Very quickly, because my face looks like you did in one four. But I'm thankful for two things. Um, Family and alcohol. (laughs) (laughs) Not in that order. (laughs) Alcohol's been giving me, getting me through some tough times lately. Mm -hmm. So is family, so that works. You're fine. Um, Also, a happy black girl moment. Um, I got a chance to... um, talk to my my 40 year old nephew um, earlier this week and we uh, we had a really great conversation where we nerded out about Star Wars and, and Avengers and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and um, hopefully I will be able to see him for the holidays for the first time in 25 years so I'm sort of super psyched about that nice. so, yeah, happy black girl moment okay so mostly alcohol, so yeah so look, um, we're gonna wait. do this again. I don't get to try and get actual transcripts. Oh, oh wait, no. yeah, sure. yeah, sure. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You, Go ahead. We don't even. We don't even know you. Hurry up. Make it fast. Oh. Move it on. <laughs> My happy black doll <laughs> moment is gonna be a little sappy, considering it's before the holiday of both Thanksgiving and evil, awful 
racist hegemony and genocide. I am thankful for moments like mm -hmm. these. I actually spent an amazing amount of time with other amazing black women in my sister circle talking about how we are going to construct a theater company and hold it down and begin to begin a community interaction around sexual assault and black women's sexual reproductive justice and ground it both in our communities mm -hmm. and in our desire for Afrofuturism and that was beautiful. And I'm having this conversation with you guys, evil heifers though you are, and that is beautiful, and that's my happy black girl moment. Evil. Yay! Yay! That sounds nice. Yay! Yay! Yay, okay. So like we all had the fuzzies, the wuzzies, the wubbies. You, you all got your bellies rubbed, right? Great, good, okay. <laughs> so thank you all for joining the us. Wubbies. I know this Tash, this this conversation went on and on and on and meandered many places. Someday we'll have an actual docket and a plan. We are also going to get a transcript up for this conversation and the other one because I'm going to make one of these broads type it up. I, I don't take dictation. I'm a terrible secretary. You'll be all right. Um, we will do this again in about a month at this rate with the holidays and everything approaching, maybe before then. Thank you so much for supporting us and for coming out. And have a good night. Enjoy night tomorrow night. as Enjoy much as you can, depending sure upon your alive. context. Yeah, no or set things on fire. Yeah, no drinking and driving. And, and frankly, <laughs> don't eat Jamie's cooking. They None of Jamie's cooking. No, yeah, don't don't have any yeah. cuisines lined up on that site. <laughs> Bye. Don't dress like a Native American. Don't. Don't do that. Don't. Yeah, just in case. Yeah, don't. You got Don't something do left over on your no, no pilgrims, no, none of that. I no. saw a castle episode last night where they yeah, had Yeah, that was face really face tragic. Yeah, you don't want to be a pilgrim. So, don't just in case. Don't, don't be don't. that dude. Don't. Don't. don't be that person. Don't. And we out. Night. We've been hood feminism. Bye. <laughs> Bye.